Okay, so this lecture is going to be a very basic introduction to conformal field theory and a little bit of the bootstrap. And the lecture was prepared for people that are really not familiar with the subject, so experts are, are going to get bored. So, so let's start with a very famous picture. So QFT, quantum field theory in general, can be thought of as the study of RG flows. And this is the idea that quantum field theories depends on the scale at which we probe them. And at very high energies and at very low energies, we have uh, fixed points. We expect that quantum field theories in these very extreme regimes are scale invariant. So in the UV and in the infrared, we expect scale invariant theories. And this is usually embedded in a bigger symmetry group called conformal symmetry. So scale invariant theories are also expected to have conformal symmetry. So conformal field theory is basically the study of these regimes. And uh, CFTs are, are very important on their own. They describe, for example, systems at criticality, condensed matter systems at criticality. Uh, in two dimensions, uh, they are very well understood and they have beautiful connections to mathematics. In particular, the theory of vertex operator algebras. Uh, thanks to the ADS CFT correspondence, uh, they also offer a window into quantum gravity. Etc. So uh, let me start with a, with a classic example of this behavior as, a, as an invitation to the subject. So we're going to review a well-known theory called the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And the Wilson-Fisher fixed point is a classic example of this behavior in which the theory in the UV is free. So this works in three dimensions. And I start with a Lagrangian for a free scalar. And then I perturb my theory, my UV fixed point, by a relevant operator. And this triggers an RG flow. This coupling starts running until eventually uh, it reaches a point here in the infrared. Let's call that uh, the coupling at that point lambda star in which the beta function is zero. So we have an interacting An interacting fixed point. So 
So, uh, one way to study, uh, a very ingenious way uh, to study this, this fixed point is known as, as the epsilon expansion. And even though uh, this fixed point is, is three-dimensional, in which I add this relevant operator that triggers this, this RG flow, it is convenient to consider the theory in, in four minus epsilon dimension. So I assume that epsilon is a small parameter, and if epsilon is a small parameter, I can do perturbation theory and calculate some quantities for this theory. And then at the end of the day, I can set epsilon one, and the hope as did that, as is that my calculations are going to give results that more or less capture the behavior of this theory. So working in this epsilon expansion, in the so-called epsilon expansion, uh, the value of the coupling at the interacting fixed point is uh, 16 over 3 pi squared times epsilon plus correction. And as I said, uh, we can use uh, this perturbative expansion to, to calculate quantities in this theory, and at the end of the day, set epsilon to 1. So uh, this is an old story, and, and the results are reasonable. Uh, moreover, the icing model, the, the critical three-dimensional icing model, uh, belongs to the same universality class as these fixed points. So whatever quantities that I calculate uh, using this epsilon expansion for the Wilson-Fisher fixed point uh, describe also uh, the three-dimensional the critical, the three critical icing model, in particular the, the critical exponents. So. Uh, as I said, this is a very uh, smart way, a very ingenious way in which one can, uh, starting from a free Lagrangian, can uh, set up a perturbation expansion so that we calculate uh, quantities for this conformal field theory. But the idea of the bootstrap is uh, to avoid this, this, this type of tricks. Of course, these this things, in order to set up this approach, uh, you need to think. Uh, a lot of smart people were involved in these things. But the idea of, of, of uh, CFT is to forget about some uh, microscopic Lagrangian description and concentrate just really on the fixed point themselves. And because we know or we assume that the fixed points have conformal symmetry, the idea of, 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 of CFT and the bootstrap in general is, is let's use, uh, let's push conformal symmetry to, to its limits. So the idea is to be agnostic about any uh, microscopic description and let's see how much we can extract from these theories knowing that they have uh, the symmetry algebra known as the conformal algebra. Yes. Yes, so I'm going to assume that scale invariance, I'm going to assume that scale invariance usually uh, implies conformal invariance. Uh, there are a lot of papers of people have tr that have tried to find uh, scale invariant theories that are not conformal invariants. I got lost at some point in the literature. I think the state of the art is that under reasonable assumptions, scale invariance usually implies uh, conformal invariance. Okay, so because we want to then, uh, because symmetry is paramount in the, in the conformal field theory approach, uh, let's review the conformal algebra. So the conformal algebra is an extension of the Poincaré algebra that we learn in, in a standard quantum field theory class. So first, we have a momentum generator, which is the generator of translations. We have Lorentz symmetry, and I'm going to denote its generators by m mu nu. We also have scale transformations, so I'm going to call the generator associated with that symmetry the dilatation operator, so this one just scales your coordinates by some, by some scale. And then uh, there is another well called special conformal transformations, which are, are less intuitive. I, I cannot describe it to you with, with words, but uh, they are a well-defined transformation in, in the coordinates, and you es expect your theory to be invariant under these four generators. 
And uh, these guys uh, have uh, uh, well-known commutation relations. And because this is an introductory lecture, I'm going to bore you with the actual uh, commutators. Okay, and the Lorentz, I'm not going to write uh, in full generality, but you probably remember that it involves four terms. Uh, mu rho, nu lambda, plus three permutations. So this, uh, I'm going to be working in Euclidean space, so this is actually the symmetry algebra of the group SOD in the dimensions. And uh, so this is the symmetry algebra that we expect uh, that our theory should have. And we can uh, make, uh, define new variables. So I'm going to define an index. So this new index, we're in Euclidean space, so it goes from 1 to d. And I can define an index that has uh, two more extra values that starts at minus 1, 0, and then goes to 1 to d. And it turns out that by defining this extra index, I can rewrite this algebra using the following definitions. So the generator that I call d, the dilatation operator, I can now call it m sub minus 1, 0. P mu is M0 mu plus N minus 1 mu. And K mu is now the difference. And why did I do this? Because if you do this, if you uh, define these new indices, you can actually check that this whole algebra, these four lines, now can be written in just one line that has the same form here. So MAB now, the conformal algebra, I just read it, write it as MAB, MCD, I, eta AD, MBC, plus three permutations. Sorry? P, P mu, K mu. The Commutators PK, I didn't write. Good spot, well spotted. So I don't have them in my notes. So homework problem. <laughs> Calculate homework. And uh, this is homework one. Homework, once you finish homework one, you can do homework two, which is to check that once you have all the uh, conformal generators, they indeed satisfy these commutation relations, which are very similar to this. The only difference is that the metric is different now. It has some minus one because of this index here. And so what I wanted to tell you is that the conformal algebra in D dimensions is quite generically S SO1, D plus one. So it is like a Lorentz group, but in two more dimensions. And... Uh, Sorry? <laughs> ah, okay, yes. Well, yeah, yeah. Homework, don't... Homework is individual. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, great, so we have the algebra. I sort of convince you that the algebra in D dimensions is sort of like a Lorentz group with some some different uh, 
signature though in, in, two, in two more dimensions. And, uh, but the, uh, our theories are going to have fields. So, so the actions of, the gener of these generators when you're doing field theory They bring. No, I, okay. So, P mu we know from quantum mechanics is just translations. Dilatation. So this, if you want, is uh, by definition what what a conformal uh, what a field in a conformal field theory is, and uh, for historical reasons, call them uh, quasi quasi primary fields. And this is a very important quantity. It's called the conformal dimension of the field. And. Uh, mm. It's uh, a very important piece of information that is going to play an extremely important role in, in the bootstrap. So Lorentz transformations, we also know from our quantum field theory class, now this sigma that I write here is in case this guy has uh, Lorentz indices. In this talk, we're going to concentrate exclusively on scalars, so, so you can ignore this thing, this part. But if you consider a field that transforms non-trivially under Lorentz, uh, then you need, uh, how the, how you need a term that acts on the, on the internal indices. And finally, the, the less intuitive transformation, the KMU, which is called special conformal. And again, there is a Lorentz part that, at least for today, uh, you can ignore. Great. Okay. So now, in uh, in a conformal field theory, we're going to have fields uh, that transform in this way, and we expect the Hilbert space of our uh, quantum field theory uh, to contain representations of the conformal algebra. So that that's what it means for a quantum field theory to be conformal invariant. When you look at the states in your in your theory, they should sit in multiplets of the conformal algebra. So what? We, yes. Not, not yet. No. The condition for being a primary, I'm going to describe now when, when I review. Uh, that's why I call those quasi-primary. The, the proper conformal primary is is coming. But for that, before defining a primary, I need a bit of. I need to introduce. Um, actually, conformal primary is, is the first concept that I'm going to introduce when we do your representation theory. So, representation theory of the conformal algebra. So, in general, we're going to define a state given a field. And to make my life easier, I'm going to describe, I'm going to review representation theory in four dimensions. Which means that then the Lorentz group in this Euclidean uh, signature is SO4, which is the same as SU2 and SU2. So the Lorentz group is SU2 and SU2. So Lorentz indices are labeled by two quantum numbers that I'm going to call J and J bar. These are the alpha and alpha dot indices, if you had a 
If you had a, if you study quantum field theory from some modern book like Srednicki or something, they, they probably taught you about alpha and alpha dot. So I'm going to define a state uh, which is given by a local operator at the opening at, uh, on the vacuum. So this is a state, and there is here, it's a, a longer story that I'm not going to have time to discuss because I have one hour only. But this is related to the state operator correspondence, which is a special feature of quantum field theory, and is that any state in your Hilbert space, you can associate a, a local operator. But uh, let's concentrate on this side because Yes, for the representation, when we look at correlators, when we start doing the hard calculations, uh, the, the external operators in our correlators are going to be scalars. But for the representation theory, uh, I, I have to consider everything. And it's very important because, uh, well, uh, we'll see later. Even if I consider external operator scalars, you st we still need to know about, opera about spinning operators. So this, this uh, uh, analysis is going to be uh, more complete, but uh, as I said, I'm going to restrict it to four dimensions. So once I define a state, a conformal primary is a state that is killed by the operator k, by the generator k. So this is the defining property of a conformal primary. And uh, the dilatation operator, and these n labels are, are the, quantum, the quantum numbers. So when you act, are sort of the, the dinking labels of your, state, of, your, of your highest weight representation. So the, the dilatation operator gives me uh, the conformal dimension of the state. Uh, and then with the generator P, nothing happens. So you create new states. So P, I can act as many times as I want, particularly n times. And these are called conformal descendants. And uh, for the generate for the Lorentz generators, uh, there is a similar. Uh, There are similar expressions, but this one should be familiar from, from quantum mechanics, right? I have two SU2s, so I can define lowering and raising operators, and an M3 that gives me the spin of the state. And so you can think of K, D, and P as analogous to the raising, lowering, and M3 operators in, in quantum mechanics. The key difference, though, is that uh, this SU2 is, is a compact group, which means that unitary representations are finite. And that's why when we study representation theory of SU2, we get the doublet, the triplet, the quadruplet, etc., with a finite number of states. The conformal group, because of this extra minus 1 that I added, this SO1, D plus 1, is, is non-compact, which means that it can have unitary representations that are infinite dimensional. And that's why the P never stop. So when you start acting with the lowering operator in the, in the J and J bar quantum numbers, at some point you, you obtain zero. But the P, you can apply it as many times as you want. So this is really a parallel between lowering, raising operators. The raising operator is the K that kills the highest weight, and you call it a conformal primary. And then with the P's, you build your, your conformal representation. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. Um, right, I, I, I cheated a bit there. <laughs> okay, so this is how we build representations, and as I said, in, in, uh, in from quantum mechanics, we're very familiar with the representations of SU2. We know them as the singlet, as the doublet, as the triplet, etc. So now, what are the representations of the conformal group, which is a bit more complicated? 
so first, there are several types of multiplet. So I'm going to use the word multiplet representation and, and conformal families. So those three words are, are synonyms for me. So when I say a conformal family, I mean a conformal multiplet, and I mean a, a representation of the conformal group. Yes. Uh, this this is just like the Lorentz group, yes, but in a higher dimensional space. Yes. So is there a mapping? Uh, there is. Case, uh, there is. There is. And I'm gonna talk okay. two lines about that, the embedding space formalism. But of course, I it's one of the reasons why I introduced that because in a higher dimensional space, the Lorentz group acts linearly, and that simplifies things things a lot. Okay. So yes, that's it's it's an important observation that that the that the conformal group is like a Lorentz grouping into more dimensions. Representations. So I'm gonna call a long representation is 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 a generic representation. So so what does it mean? I I have a, a field. Now, now I'm going to change again notations a bit. Um, but no, not yet, not yet. So, so I have a generic operator killed, a generic primary killed by, by k mu with quantum numbers delta, j and j bar. These have to be half integers, but delta can be any real number. Uh, above some certain uh, value, uh, which is known as a, as a unitarity bound. And uh, in order to build the representation, I can just start acting with the, uh, with the, with the momentum operator, with the momentum generator, which amounts to just taking derivatives. So a conformal primary and all its derivatives it's, uh, it's what I call a generic representation. However, there are cases for some special values of the quantum numbers in which uh, the multiplet that I can construct is, is somehow shorter. And, and uh, even though they are infinite dimensional, you can think of them as shorted as, as your generic representation. So I think it's easier that if I, that if I explain this with, with examples. So one very famous representation, one very famous representation is a free scalar. So a free scalar is represented by a field phi, in which the quantum numbers are delta equals one, and the Lorentz numbers are zero. And we know that a free scalar satisfies uh, equations of motions. We know that d mu, d mu acting on phi x equals zero. So this is why I'm calling this particular uh, field representation of the conformal algebra short. I told you that you build a representation by acting with derivatives. And in principle, nothing should happen. But for a free scalar, there is this, this, it has this special property, right? You start building the representation acting with your lowering operator. And an operator that, and a state that could have been there, it's not there anymore. So that's why I call this a short multiplet of the, of the conformal algebra. You don't expect these this, uh, equations to, to, to be satisfied if delta, for example, is two or three or four. It's only the free scalar uh, that satisfies this condition. So free fermions, they are also they also sit in short multiplets of the of the conformal algebra. And these have delta three over two, three over two, and quantum numbers one half zero and zero one half. And uh, the condition that they satisfy is of course uh, Dirac's equation. And again, 
this is a descendant that could have been there in general, but in this very particular case, when delta equals 3 over 2, it's not there. Uh, so finally, there are two more short representations that I want to tell you about. We can also have uh, conserved currents. J mu x and the conservation condition is d mu j mu x and the quantum numbers are 3 over 3 1 half 1 half and finally a very important uh, operator is the stress tensor the stress energy tensor which also sits in a short multiplet of the conformal algebra. And the quantum numbers are 4, 1, 1 in this case. So on to one final more technical term. So generic long multiplets, delta is only constrained to be greater or equal than 2 plus L j plus j bar. This is known as a unitarity bound. And when, when these two guys are zero, um, sorry, I, I got confused a bit now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write you the unitarity bound when j equals j bar, because I don't want to say anything wrong. j equals j bar, such that L equals J plus J bar. L plus 2 and greater than 1 when L equals 0. So these conserved currents saturate the unitarity bounds. So what, what, what we learn is that when your genetic long multiplets, the delta saturates the unitarity bound, uh, a special thing happens. And that, in particular, this shortening condition corresponds to, to uh, equations of motions. So great, so that's all I wanted to say. What, what, the, the purpose of this review of, of uh, representation theory of the conformal algebra is that I wanted to reinterpret these uh, well-known uh, field equations, but now from a, a group theoretical point of view. You can think of them now, equations of motions, as, as so, sort of shortening conditions of, of the conformal algebra. Great, so now we can start doing some field theory and study correlation functions. So we're interested in correlators. As I said, we're only going to look at scalars. And now, uh, going back uh, to, to the question regarding uh, the fact that the conformal group is like a Lorentz group in two more dimensions, a very efficient way to study correlators is using the embedding space. As I said, because I only have uh, one hour, in which 30 minutes are gone already, I'm not going to talk about, but the idea is that one can embed the real space, like the, for example, the four-dimensional space, in a bigger six-dimensional space. And in this bigger six-dimensional space, the conformal algebra acts linearly, so it's very easy to study invariance, for example, to to study correlation functions. And once you do your whole analysis in this higher dimensional space, you can project down to the, to the actual space and, and, and get the, the right answer. So as I said, uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but 
I just wanted to say two lines regarding the idea. So we embed the so think of R D embedded in R one comma D plus one. And this space has some coordinates that I'm gonna call big X A. Do your whole analysis in this bigger dimensional space in which the Lorentz, in which the conformal group has a very simple action, and at the end of the day, project down to the fourth dimensional space. So there's a lot of literature, and this thing started with Dirac, like in the 1930s. And for scalars in particular, it might be an, an overkill to, to develop this whole technology. But if you want to study more complicated correlators with, with spinning operators, then the embedding space is an extremely useful tool. So for today, I'm not going to talk about the embedding space. I'm going to follow a more uh, I'm going to follow a more standard approach. I mean, the more classic approach of just uh, applying the generators that I showed you before to, to correlators. But uh, you can simplify your life a lot if, if you learn these techniques. OK, so one point functions. So one point functions. First, we know uh, there is translation symmetry. So this thing cannot depend on the one coordinate that we have in the correlator. So the only thing that can happen is that you can have a constant. If you act now with the dilatation operator on this correlator, uh, I wrote the operator before, so if you go back to your notes, you should have it there. You get x mu d mu acting on a constant is zero, so the only thing that you get is that delta times c has to be zero, which in general, implies that c equals zero when delta is different than zero. So the one operator that can actually have a non-zero uh, one-point function is the identity operator. And the identity operator is the one that has delta equals, equals zero. So that way is, is the one exception to this rule. But in general, one-point functions of scalar in conformal field theory are zero. So that was fast. Let's go now to two-point functions. Well, that's another story. I'm going to concentrate in this talk and theories with with uh, with. Uh, with, uh, that have conformal symmetry, but of course you, you can break it in many ways. No, of course not. We're, we're, we're going to consider theories that have the full conformal symmetry, but of course you, you can break it. And uh, you can indeed give VEFs to a scalar for theories that have moduli spaces. In supersymmetric theories, that's very common. Or you can perturb your theory with a relevant operator, like, like I did at the beginning with the Wilson Fisher fixed point. The theory was free and conformal in the UV, but then you perturb it by an operator that, of course, takes it away from conformality. OK, so two-point functions now. And uh, two points. And again, Lorentz symmetry and rotation symmetry, translation and Lorentz symmetry tells me that two-point functions are a function only of the difference of the two points. This we know from, from standard quantum field theory. But if you add uh, scale invariance now, and you add with D now, let's act with D on this correlator, you get a differential equation for this function f. And uh, the solution tells us that two-point function 
have to be just an inverse power. Now the the the, the power, if you just impose dilatation uh, symmetry, it does not impose constraints on delta 1 and delta 2. If you impose now the k-generator, which I'm not going to do because it's very complicated to do, especially in the normal space, in the embedding space, this calculation is a lot easier. But in the normal space, if you are with k, you can actually prove that delta 1 has to be equal to delta 2. So the power here, I'm going to call it 2 delta when delta equals delta 1 equals delta 2. So, so here we start seeing already the power of conformal symmetry. In a generic Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, this can be any function of R. If you impose that your theory is conformal, the kinematic dependence is completely fixed. The coordinate dependence of this function is, is completely fixed. The only unknown variable is this delta, which is associated with this particular field. And uh, it's called the conformal dimension. So this is a very nice feature of conformal symmetry that one can separate the kinematics, the coordinate dependence, with the dynamics. Right, right, times a constant that uh, you can absorb indeed. So it is standard to define this, this this as a 1. In two-point functions, you put a 1 there. And of course, now the three-point functions, the coefficients uh, have meaning. So then let's go very fast now to three-point functions then. And the same story. Uh, I'm just going to give you the answer again. Doing it in the standard space, in the fourth dimensional space or the dimensional space is, is actually quite complicated. If, if you learn the embedding space techniques, uh, these calculations are a triviality. Yes. Assuming that the vacuum there uh, is invariant under D, right? Yes. But, but again, why can't there be spontaneous breaking? Why does the vacuum have to be invariant? You want to give a, you want to give a scale? You want to? I mean, this is, there, there's a big debate about this. So, what's, I mean, it's a question of whether there can be a dilaton right. uh, state. So, right. you're saying, do you know that there can't be? No, oh, I'm not saying that I, I know. I'm certainly not saying that I know that it can be. I'm just saying if it's not broken, then now you get that relation. Right. I mean, I don't want to see any scale in any of the equations that I. No, I, I know, but I'm just asking. I mean, maybe people in the audience, anybody knows whether there's any argument well that why it, yeah, the vacuum I, has to be invariant. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's the definition of. Interesting theory, if you took a mass deformation continuously to zero, would you definitely get a, a non-broken theory? I mean, it's a dynamical question in a, in a real physical system, right? Just this, um, you can ask the same thing for chiral symmetry breaking, for example. I, I don't know. I, I think some people think it doesn't exist. I was just curious, okay. does anybody know? So if you put it on a sphere, then there's usually an extra mass term that's generated by curvature, and it'll take it to the, to the fixed point. So the ground state will be the, the fixed point. Okay, so uh, for three-point functions, uh, the same comment that I made for two-point functions apply. The, the, the beauty of, 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 of conformal symmetry is that there is a neat separation between the kinematics, again, the coordinate dependence, 
and the dynamics. So I have introduced a new quantity here, which are these three-point couplings. And uh, together with these conformal dimensions, uh, they are collectively known as the CFT data. So the CFT data is what distinguishes formal uh, theories. So the two-point functions and the three-point functions, they have to have this form because we prove them using uh, just symmetry. But of course, uh, we expect many conformal theories to exist, and they are going to differ, for example, in the values of the deltas and the lambdas. And so uh, what I'm going to try to convince you now in the last uh, 20 minutes is that the information that you can extract from the two-point functions, if, if you know the two-point functions of the three and the three-point functions, in principle, you know everything. Four-point functions, five-point functions, six-point functions, et cetera, if you know. And uh, so that way, this is a very important uh, collection of data, the CFT data. And so, as I said in the last 20 minutes, I want to convince you that if you know these things, you can also in principle, calculate uh, the four-point functions. Uh, OK, so So four-point functions cannot be fixed uh, completely kinematically. There is because one can build uh, invariants of the coordinates, which are known as cross ratios. So these two cross ratios, you can prove they are actually invariant under the conformal algebra. It's clear that they are invariant under translations, under Lorentz, and also it's also, it's also clear that they are uh, invariant under dilatations because if you multiply everything by a scale, uh, it cancels in the ratio. It's not so obvious, again, that they are invariant under this k mu generator, the special conformal, but they are. So these are two invariants, and uh, the problem with these two invariants is that this means that four-point functions, unlike one, two, and three-point functions, cannot be fixed uh, kinematically. You can have an arbitrary function of these two cross ratios, and it's going to satisfy, uh, yes? No, it is not. <laughs> x2, x4. It should be the same denominator for the two cross ratios. So, in general, quite generically, although I'm, I'm going to make my life simpler, I'm going to now put the scalars uh, identical. So, even if you have four identical scalars, you cannot fix uh, the four-point function kinematically. Mm -hmm. Ah, I put them all the same. So, but still, uh, we can do something with it, even though now uh, you might say, okay, it's over, now I have to start doing some work and calculate this guy. So the last... Uh, very important piece of information that I need to introduce is what's called uh, the operator product expansion.
And the operator product expansion is the statement that the product of two operators can be written as a sum of local operators. Now, this C here is a, is, a, is a kinematical operator that acts, acts on, on O, on some uh, generic uh, conformal primary. And this, of course, uh, gives you descendants of this conformal primary. The fact that a primary and its descendants have the same coefficient here is the statement of conformal symmetry. So from this operator product expansion, you can, for example, take the bracket this expression with, a, with, with another O here. And in this sum, uh, it's going to select only uh, it, it, it's going to select only the, the, its own conformal family. And from this expression, one can, for example, obtain the three-point function. So the three-point function with a generic O here can be obtained by bracketing, if you want, with, with an O here. And what's going to select is uh, the corresponding operator with its right OP coefficient. And if you put a descendant of some particular primary, it's going to select the descendant, of course, but again with the same OP coefficient, up to some kinematical, kinematical factors. So this is a very important equation because, I, as I promised you, by repeated operator of the by repeated application of the operator product expansion, you can reduce any endpoint function in the end to a sum of just two point function times kinematical factors. And so, if you know these kinematical factors and you know three point functions and conformal uh, and conformal dimensions, then you you know everything. Now, the bootstrap philosophy is actually uh, the reversed. The idea is not uh, to, to calculate the CFT data, calculate all the two-point functions and three-point functions, and then use it to calculate four-point functions. The idea of the bootstrap is, let's start with the four-point functions and try to find which consistency requirements it satisfies, such that one can fix this data. So that, that's the idea of the bootstrap. And in the last 15 minutes or 10 minutes, I want to show you, uh, tell you a little bit how the implementation works. So the idea is to consider the four-point function now and apply the operator product expansion. So I can apply now the operator product expansion to these two guys and these two guys. And then, uh, because conformal families are orthogonal, you can think of it that you are going to reduce this four-point function to a sort of sum, quotation marks, because there are many uh, kinematical factors here, a sort of sum between two-point functions. So you apply the operator product expansion here, you apply the operator product expansion here, and when you replace this formula, uh, you replace the four-point function as a sort of sum of two-point functions. But these are kinematically fixed, so you can actually calculate this two-point function and then add them all. Of course, this is a very complicated calculation, but it can be done. And uh, when all the dust has settled, what happens is that the four-point function now can be written as a sum So sum of terms that capture the operators that appear here in the operator product expansion. So this object, this, this, sum, this sum of two-point functions with very complicated kinematical factors can be rewritten on, on, on this way. This guy are known as conformal blocks. And they capture the contribution of each conformal family to the operator product expansion. 
So the contribution of each of these operators that are being exchanged here is captured uh, by the conformal block. And these conformal blocks are known, are fixed. So I'm, I'm actually going to write them for you just for, for the record. Where do I have them? So these conformal blocks, let's write them here. First, I need to change variables. Instead of u and v, I'm going to talk about c and z bar. Think of this for the moment as just a change of variables. u z is c times z bar, and v is 1 minus c and 1 minus z bar. And this conformal block then, which depends on the conformal mentioned delta and the spin l of the operator being exchanged, is c c bar c minus c bar times a function k delta plus l z. Run out of space. C z bar c minus c bar times parentheses k and minus now the same term with c and z bar exchange. It's symmetric in c and z bar as obvious from the from the change of variable. And again, the same statement that, that I said before is that in conformal symmetry, we have again a, a, a neat separation between the kinematics. So this guy depends on the coordinates on the cross ratios, just kinematics. And these deltas, of course, uh, uh, are dynamical data, but this function k is known, it's, it's a hypergeometric function. So if you know the CFT data, if you give me a bag with all the deltas and all the lambdas in your theory, I can just apply this equation, put the lambdas here. This is hypergeometric function, so I put the deltas here, and I do this sum, and in principle, I'm done. I obtain, I, I, I managed to, to calculate the four-point function. Now, the idea of the bootstrap, as I said, is, is the opposite, because calculating all the CFT data by independent means might be something very hard to do, if not impossible. The idea of the bootstrap is, well, seeing that the CFT data is here in this correlator that has so much structure, is it possible to find some condition on this four-point function that is going to impose constraints on this CFT data, in particular the three-point functions on the... Yes. Uh, there are... Many things can be said uh, about the C and Z bar coordinates. So, oh, yeah. So you can Which actually. Are these complex? To, gives you two two extra real lines. Well, in the so, if you have a four point function by conformal symmetry, you can always put the operators coplanar. If you work out uh, the proper change of variables, etc., you send one point to zero, one to infinity. And, uh, and and do the right calculations, this, this C and Z bar actually become the coordinates of this plane. And whether they are conjugate uh, of each other depends on the signature that you're considering. So in, this, in the Euclidean signature that I'm considering, they are complex conjugate to each other. But if you consider Lorentz, uh, Lorentzian signature, they are actually independent real variables. But as I said, if, if you follow the, the, the coplanar argument, great. If you didn't, think of them as just as new variables with, with funny names, C, C and Z bar. So, so I'm reaching my, my, my last equation. So uh, in the same way that I apply the operator product expansion to decompose this four-point function by uh, contracting these two operators, I can also consider a separate uh, contraction. I can also contract two and three, and one and four, and replace by the operator product expansion and do the same calculation. And that's the statement of crossing symmetry. So equality of this decomposition, and now the second decomposition that I'm, that I'm uh, telling you about here, That's the statement of crossing symmetry. So the same correlator
Um, sorry, now I'm doing the other contraction. So this is one four and this is two three. And now the cross ratios, instead of having u and v, I have v and u. And so this guy has to be equal to this guy. So this is the famous crossing symmetry constraint that is usually represented pictorially like this. And as I said, if you know the two-point functions and the three-point functions, you can use this equation to calculate the four-point function, but the idea of the bootstrap is the opposite. We don't know the two-point function or the three-point functions in general. Once you impose this condition, let, let's look at it. I mean, this condition has to be true for any value of u and v, which are real variables. And you can think of it as, as an overcomplete set of equations for, for, for the deltas and the lambdas. So for any value of v and u, this equation has to be, has to be satisfied. And so, as I said, this, this, this lecture was, is, was going to be an introduction to CFT and a little bit of the bootstrap. On the, the next lecture uh, by Madalena, she's going to explain you how to use this equation to actually extract, uh, extract results. So one, one uh, comment in passing, though, is that in two dimensions, uh, two dimensions is a success story of the bootstrap. In two dimensions, this equation had can be solved exactly. And the reason is because the conformal group in two dimensions is bigger, right? The conformal symmetry is enhanced to be the Soto algebra. And what it means is that several conformal families, so several of these terms that contribute to this sum, which in principle is infinite, they are actually related by each other uh, by the Soto symmetry. So when you write these bootstrap equations, the same equations in two dimensions, and now taking into account the Soto symmetry, there are actually solutions that have a finite number of terms. So the sum here has a finite number of terms, and the sum here has a finite number of terms. And when you have sums with finite numbers of terms, you can do a lot, a lot more. And that's why in two dimensions, uh, the bootstrap was an absolute success, because people managed to solve these equations in full generality. And uh, classic examples are, are the minimal models, the two-dimensional minimal models. In higher dimensions, because we don't have Vira Soro symmetry, there is an infinite sum uh, on each side of the equation. And then uh, the techniques that we're using in two dimensions do not work. And that's why somehow the, the bootstrap, uh, the, the, the field lay dormant uh, for many years, because no one knew really how to extract uh, information from the higher dimensional uh, bootstrap equations until uh, 2008, where the whole numerical bootstrap started that somehow reignited uh, the interest and uh, and even though we still uh, don't have an exact solution for this equation a lot of things have been learned not only numerically but people have also taken now very interesting analytic limits in this in this equation and they have managed to obtain uh, uh, quite interesting results so uh, that's what i have to say So any questions? Do you get any new constraints if you consider uh, six-point functions, for example, rather than just four-point functions? Um, I have to think. If they are identical, I would say no. But if they are different, So, I mean, for sure, you're going to get new constraints. The question is that do you need to do it? If you manage to solve, uh, I mean, yeah, let, let, let me rephrase the question. What we want is to obtain three-point functions, all the three-point functions and all the conformal dimensions. The question is, can you obtain them all by just looking at all possible four-point functions? Uh, I don't know. I would think that maybe the answer would be yes, maybe, if you manage to solve them really all. So maybe we don't really need to go to... I, mean, I think I think the answer is yes. I mean, because of factorization, right. a, a six-point function, be, you know, you pinch two together and you get excited states and then you get four-point functions, right? 
Right. So if you knew all of them, all of them, absolutely, all, all of them, them then, say, yeah. then you know, since the same coupling constants come in, uh, it can reduce to. I mean, this is how the vertex algebra work basically, right? It can reduce to a set of four-point functions, or it could reduce to n-point functions with only the outside scalar. Those are going to be identical. Right. Right. But yeah, you need to know them all, of course. Question. Uh, so does the topology of the manifold affect the uh, CFT data? Well, I think uh, in, in, in two dimensions, uh, imposing modular invariance is, is a constraint, is a valid constraint that, 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 you can, that you can impose, that people do. In higher dimensions, I think one can also do uh, similar things, but as far as I know, uh, not much uh, research, not, not many papers have, have been written on the subject. I think there are one, one or two papers in which one consider uh, theories in the, in some projective space. And uh, but yeah, so far, I mean, most of the work has been done in standard, flat, uh, four-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, coming from sort of uh, quantum field theory side and looking at actually from condensed matter physics of looking at quantum critical points where you have these conformal field theories sort of emerge naturally at these critical points. There are clear differences between sort of field theories with just bosonic degrees of freedom and one where sort of massless fermions or some kind of Fermi surface and things like that emerge. Now from just this description, if I understand right, it, sh it shouldn't matter whether they are fermions or bosons, just some symmetries and right. certain things. So how do fermions or those kind of features emerge in your uh, sort of bootstrap or whatever language you're talking about? I mean, f for sure you can put fermions as external operators, for sure. But, but the question, which microscopic description uh, corresponds to your theory, the, your fi let's say that using the Bootsab equation you dis discover some fixed point. I don't think from here you can learn much about whatever, which microscopic description. In fact, I think there are examples uh, of, of known as infrared dualities in which you have two different UV descriptions and then they flow to the same infrared fixed point. So if you manage to how to, <coughs> if, you, if you solve the infrared fixed point on its own, I'm not sure you can actually trace back and, and, and point out one particular UV, UV description. But in the fixed point, uh, without thinking about the microscopic Lagrange description, for sure you can put uh, spinning operators external, and people have done it. There are already books of papers in which people have considered correlators of, of fermions. Right, 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 that's right. That, so that was the bootstrap yeah. goes for the CFT data. You can, yeah. And if you're you smart details. enough to give me different description that give me the same CFT data, as long as our result is the same, everybody happy. Okay.